All right, hello everyone. Thank you for joining us today um, on the Operations Intercultural Competence uh, Seminar section that you've all joined. There may be a few more people that are gonna be signing on, uh, which is totally fine. We welcome and wanna include everyone that wants to join us today. Um, so I'll go ahead and reintroduce myself in case you you know didn't see me earlier. I've been hosting and being the MC of this fabulous event today. Um, so, but I wanna first introduce our guest speaker, part of the intercultural programs team, um, the assistant director, Ms. Katie Russo is here with us today. Um, Katie, I don't know if you wanted to share any uh, quick words or anything like that. Sure, so like Betsy said, uh, my name is Katie Russo. I'm the Assistant Director of Intercultural Programs and I'm so excited to talk to all of you today. So thank you so much for that lovely introduction, Betsy. But yes, always. It looks like always. <laughs> So it looks like we have a few more people joining. Um, do we want to go ahead and get started? I, I, we've got jam-packed information, Katie. Um, so again, guys, I'm Betsy Shea. I'm one of the associate directors here at the University Career Center. And Katie and myself have partnered up to give you a jam-packed um, session on leveraging your intercultural competency, both on your resume, as well as you know, really to boost you in professional settings. So we're going to share with you what that looks like, what is intercultural competency and how you can really navigate and showcase in a positive way um, all of your fantastic intercultural skills, as well as if you've got international experiences and knowledge, um, lots of ways uh, that you'll be able to really leverage uh, these wonderful abilities. So without further ado, Katie, I'll turn it over to you. Okay. So like Betsy mentioned, so our objective is to really reflect on the importance of developing these skills, your intercultural skills, and how you can integrate those skills on your resume, but really not just your resume. How can you reflect on the or integrate those skills into a job interview, interview into your career, into those internships, and into the classroom, all those things that you're studying. So how can you kind of mesh all of these skills together? So we're going to talk a little bit about that. And so first off, what are why why are these skills important? So employers are looking for people who have that ability to communicate effectively and appropriately in a variety of cultural contexts. So Jeanette Bennett, she is an interculturalist and she says that intercultural or now I'm having trouble concentrating today. It's Friday. So she says that intercultural communication is the ability to collaborate internationally, understand global partners and clients, integrate new perspectives into the company, and work effectively in multi multicultural teams. This is what employers are all looking for. So these are why you need to develop these intercultural skills. You know, guys, we saw this with the pandemic, right? We're all working virtually, we're all connecting virtually. So these are all things that you really need to hone in on, you really need to work on. And so these are all things that employers want to see on your resume and how you can build that. So you can all build these skills here at UT Dallas. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about how you can build those. But first, what is intercultural competence? So the ability to communicate effectively and appropriately in a variety of cultural con contexts. I wonder if my slides got a little funky right there. Yeah, might've gotten that way. Sorry guys, my tech skills are a little bit out of date. So Jeanette Bennett, my favorite interculturalist, she's amazing. So she also says that to be interculturally competent, you need to have a mindset. So you need to have the knowledge. You need to know about cultures. You need to learn. You need to really expand your knowledge. You need to have that skill set. So those things that you're learning in the classroom, those things that you go out and you actually get those skills, you get those internships, you get those jobs and you need to have the heart set. That's that attitude. That's that willingness to get the experience. So you need those three things to be interculturally competent, right? You have to have all of those together. You can't just be like, oh, I'm interculturally competent because I know a lot about a culture. No, you have to have all of those combined. But what is culture? So 
culture is a lot of different things. So it's traditions, beliefs, values, norms, symbols, behavior patterns, communication. I don't have to read everything that's on the slide because you guys can read it. But so many different things go into culture, right? And culture is not just based on the region where you grew up or it's not just the country where you are born. Culture is so many different things, right? So for example, I'm gonna use my little props. I'm an artist, I paint. Art is part of my culture. So this is a symbol of my culture, but I'm also a US citizen. That's part of my culture. So, you know, celebrating the traditions of my culture is, you know, being an American but celebrating traditions of my artist culture is painting and having those artifacts, my paintbrush, my paints, all those things. So these are all parts of my culture. So objective culture is those artifacts. So the American flag is an artifact of my culture, my paints, my paintbrush, that's an artifact of my culture. All those things that are created by a group of interacting people. So like I said in my examples, art, holidays, literature, dance, things like that are all parts of objective culture, kind of those tangible items that you can actually like look at and feel and touch. There's also subjective culture though. So those are those share, shared values and beliefs and behaviors of a group of interacting people. So this could be religion, this could be ideas, cultural norms, um, a big one that I always teach during international student orientation, a cultural norm of the United States is tipping for services. So not a lot of other countries tip for services at a restaurant or at a hairdresser, something like that. That's a cultural norm. Um, cultural norm as for me as an artist is to be more of a free thinker, more creative, not be bound by lines and constrictions. That's a cultural norm. And so that trickles down into a lot of other work that I do, even in my current job is I'm a little bit more flexible and changeable. I don't have a set schedule always. So that's kind of an artist's subjective culture. So you think about that in terms of culture cultural generaliz generalizations. So this is something that gets a little bit confused with cultural stereotypes. So I like to talk about these a little bit when we talk about culture. So a cultural generalization, this is the tendency for a majority of people in a cultural group to hold certain values or beliefs or maybe have certain patterns of behavior. So an example of this, and I'm gonna use myself. So like I said, I'm an American, I'm a US citizen. Americans tend to be independent. So they value independence. I think that's a really big thing for American culture, right? So those of you who are American in this group, you can probably identify with that. So it's very important for Americans to identify with being independent. However, this doesn't mean that every single American citizen is always independent all the time and doesn't ever want help from anyone else because that would be considered a cultural stereotype. So that's when we're applying those cultural generalizations to every single person in a cultural group all the time. So for example, if I were to walk by somebody who is struggling with a really heavy box and they can't carry it, if I just walk by them, I'm like, oh, they're an American. They want to be independent. They can carry that themselves. No, they don't need any help. Okay, that'd probably be really wrong of me, right? That's a cultural stereotype that I'm making of that person. Okay, so because I'm applying that cultural generalization to them and it's a cultural stereotype at that point. So we have to be careful not to mix those up. But that's something we can learn as we're kind of investigating this intercultural competency and we're learning through this. Any questions about that? Because those ones can get a little bit tricky. But we will learn. I know. It's all right. You guys can ask questions later. So as we talk more about culture, this is a really great visual visualization that I like to use. And people have seen these before with other things, but the cultural iceberg metaphor. So our cultural ice or an iceberg, as you know, you know, most of it is below the surface and there's just a little bit that peeks out over the ocean. So our artifacts are what we see, you know, our artifacts, that's the, you know, the art and the dance and those things that we see up at the very top. And then underneath the ocean, you know, at the very 
surface level, that's the language and the verbal communications. We know that's part of culture, but then right down beneath, that's when we get those things that we don't necessarily know until we experience the culture. You know, having those cultural norms and the values until you're really living in a culture, you might not really get that. And so that's that bigger part of the iceberg that you're like, wow, until I really was experiencing this culture, I didn't know any of this. At the very bottom, that's the universal human needs, right? Security, food, water, everybody needs those. And so that's what everyone needs. And so this cultural iceberg metaphor is a really good one because I think it really gives a good visual perspective of what culture actually is. And so if you were kind of not understanding culture, then you can look at this and say, okay, now I get it. So part of culture, and we've talked a little bit about this, is communication. So we have our verbal communication, and that's written and spoken language. I think that one's pretty obvious. So you have your, you know, just spoken language and you have your written language. But a lot of that that comes into play is nonverbal. So you can see I'm talking with my hands a lot. I use gestures. I like to emphasize my points. This is all behavior that modifies or adds to the verbal or spoken or verbal or written language. And so this is really big in culture. So you've seen a lot of times when nodding a head could mean yes, but in some cultures, nodding your head like this might mean no. Sometimes a gesture like thumbs up here in the United States, this means yes or good job. In some cultures, this could mean something completely derogatory or it could mean a rude gesture. So nonverbal communication is a huge part of culture. This is something that I've gone over with our iFriend program that sometimes this is where miscommunication happens a lot. And so when you're talking to someone from another culture, you might not understand that these nonverbal communications might be where that confusion is happening. And so it's important to talk to each other and say, well, when you did this, what what were you meaning? Were you saying yes or were you saying something mean to me? And so that's what it's important to talk about those types of things and language. Along the same line is communication styles. So I have a little chart here of communication styles. So everybody has their own communication styles. And sometimes um, similar to cultural generalizations is some cultures in general follow similar communication styles. So linear communication style, these are people who get straight to the point. So people who are just like, you need to do this. This is my expectation of you. This is what I want. Some people, they talk in more of a circular fashion. So they're like, well, this is what needs to happen because this happens and this happens. And if you don't do it this way, this is gonna happen and this is gonna happen. And they might kind of tell a story around the point. And so you'll notice that when you're interacting with people, you might need to change your communication style in order to get what you're looking for. You'll probably even notice sometimes, depending on who you're interacting with, you might need to change your communication style with just because of who you're interacting with. So for example, if I'm talking to my supervisor, I might use a more linear linear approach. If I'm talking to my mom, I'm not going to do that. I might use a more circular approach because it just gets a better result. And that's because my boss is from one culture, my mom's from another culture, but I also interact differently with my mom, right? So communication styles might change depending on what culture someone is coming from and just how they interact with that person or how you interact with that person. So you have linear, linear and you have circular. You have direct, so the meaning is stated directly. This is what I mean, this is what I want. Indirect, the meaning is implied. So this one can be tricky. So, you know, someone, this is more the fault is on the listener. So someone might say, oh, I, I do like this food, but I really like the other food too. So that you might have to kind of understand something that they're saying it's more maybe sarcastic or it's more implied and the listener it's, has to listen for the meaning as opposed to the presenter giving you the meaning. So detached, keeping emotion out of it. So 
this might be somebody who is just very serious. They're just saying, giving you information, no emotion, nothing. Attached, showing your passion. So these are kind of opposite, right? So you're giving a lot of information, you're showing your passion, you're telling someone a story and you're giving that passion about something. I like to think the left column in a straight line has a very similar characteristics and the right column in a straight line has a very similar characteristics. I always tell people when I give this presentation, if you guys know the show, The Big Bang Theory, Sheldon, he's a very linear um, speaker. He's very direct when he talks. He's very detached. He, he doesn't have a lot of emotion, right? He's very intellectual, so he doesn't take things personally, right? And abstract, he uses theories, principles, facts, but then if you look at the right side, so another character on the Big Fat Bang Theory, Penny. She's very circular. She always has a story when she tells something, right? She's like, oh, I live on this farm and there's this pig and this happened. She's very indirect. So she has, you know, she uses a lot of sarcasm when she talks and Sheldon doesn't get it. So she's taught him that. She's very attached and very emotional. She's very relational. She's very concrete when she uses her stories and examples and metaphors. And so they've had to learn to work together to understand these communication styles. There we go. So developing your own intercultural competence, first of all, you have to understand your own culture. So like I said, understand those communication styles that you have on that page that I just talked about and how you can work with other people's communication styles. Understand your own traditions, your values, your beliefs. Learn about a new culture. We'll talk about that in just a minute. How can you learn about a new culture at UTD? Spend some time, some time with members of a new culture. Learn to interact with people, observe, understand, and be open to new ideas and concepts. Be curious, be willing to make mistakes, okay? You're gonna make mistakes when you're learning about new ideas, right? You're going to make those mistakes and it's okay. Ask for help, ask questions, and be willing to do that. I made mistakes. I studied abroad in France, guys. I accidentally told my French family on the very first night I was there that I was pregnant in French when I was really just trying to tell them that I didn't want any more food and I was full. So trust me, you will make mistakes if you're learning new cultures. Okay, some intercultural opportunities at UT Dallas. First of all, there's education abroad. I think that's one that if you want to learn a completely new um, country and a new culture and a new language, you can study abroad. So this is a really great way. Um, I put the Education Abroad website on here if that's something that you're interested in doing. They have so many different opportunities. If you'd like to go on an exchange program, if you'd like to study abroad for a semester or a year, Absolutely, you can do those opportunities. However, there's also opportunities at home. And so we have experiential learning. So I talked about our iFriend program earlier. We pair up international students with domestic students to meet throughout the semester. We have it both virtually and in person. So if you're not here in the US yet, or if you're not comfortable um, meeting with someone in person, we can absolutely accommodate that. So you can take a look at our website. We also have the Global Leadership Retreat, and this is a partnership with the Leadership Center. And so this is an opportunity for you to do um, a two night retreat where we go through leadership programs through different with different departments and we do um, leadership training with students. You have foreign language courses. You can take academic courses related to globalization, diversity, traditions, communication. We also have global awareness events through our office. So we have International Week, informally called iWeek. This is my favorite week. It happens every spring, so it's going to be at the end of March 2022. I'm hoping it's on campus this year, so cheer for me, guys. We have Instagram Live events, global engagement series. So I posted our website. So please take a look at our website and you'll be able to see all of our events on the comic calendar and all the events that we host. I put some examples here, but this is not all of our events. So please take a look at us and you can get involved with our office to see what other events you can come and join us for. I also he have a couple different websites here. So there's intercultural competence training. We have some virtual trainings that we have on our website that are through um, Purdue University Global and a few other web pages. So I have a link to it here. The Multicultural Center is also an awesome resource. So take a look at them because I highly support them. 
um, and cultural student organizations, great people to join. Even if you're not part of that particular culture, you can absolutely join them and join their events. So you can visit our website and you can see a list of the different cultural student organizations that are available. And then we have some marketable skills. So this is a really cool um, student leadership program initiative, and it's a really concrete way to understand the impact of your experience. So for example, marketable skills will give you a concrete way of writing these skills on your resume. So I wrote out an example here. So by participating in the iFriend program, I was able to interact on a regular basis with someone from another culture who became my personal and professional contact. Um, I have a few other bullet points here, and Betsy's going to share a few other examples of how to write things like this on your resume. But this is something that the student leadership programs created as an initiative of marketable skills of joining programs like this on campus. And so we support that as well. And um, iFriend is one of those marketable skills. OK, and I think Betsy, you are up next. Navigate forward to your slides. All right, perfect, Katie. You did such a great job being able to really delve into, you know, what it means to be intercultural and how you can combine and intertwine um, those competencies with career and you know what that means what students can join to get more intercultural competencies um, so now is the part of the presentation where i'm going to take it a step further and we're going to look at now that you know what intercultural competencies are and why they're important uh, we're going to tie that in with how that impacts your career preparation so intercultural and career is what we are moving into now uh, we will end um, right on the nose at 12, 18 or 12, 19 to make sure that you can get into the final remarks, the closing of our summit today uh, at 12, 20. So I'll just preface my session uh, with, you know, we're gonna fly through some of this information. Some of it we can move to the next slide because either, you know, you might've already gone to a session um, that, that already touched base on some of these topics and, or again, you know, I can't stress to you enough, just reach out to me, reach out to our University Career Center, reach out to Katie if you'd like um, more information or if you have more questions. So definitely, I don't want you to leave here today thinking, oh gosh, you know, it went fast and I had questions that didn't get answered. You know, I just can't tell you enough, just reach out to us and you can schedule an appointment or you can just talk to us on Teams, you know, or reach us through our organization's website um, and we will get back to you. All right. So I just want to make sure that you know that we want to hear from you and that your voices are heard. All right. So just a quote here, I, I think is really great to start off with. Uh, to effectively communicate, we must realize that we are all different in a way that we perceive the world and use this understanding as a guide to our communication with others. All right. And that is from Anthony Robbins. So now I'm gonna get into a little bit more of defining cultural, uh, the understanding of it, all right? Uh, I know Katie went into this uh, a little bit in hers, but just as a refresher, it's when you actively try to understand someone fully, including their cultural background, their beliefs, their values, and that you're engaging in cultural understanding, all right? So as you are making your way towards this cultural understanding, you will then start achieving intercultural competence. So hopefully that makes sense. All right, so looking at intercultural competency, we already kind of went over a lot of these aspects with Katie. She did a great job uh, being able to identify, you know, what some of those skill sets and what that fluency can look like. Uh, but again, just to share with you some, some other um, tidbits of information regarding how to identify, you know, some of your intercultural um, ideations, being able to identify your own culture and norms, being able to recognize commonalities and differences, all right? Being able to understand influences of history, geography, religion, gender, race, ethnicity, and other factors on one's identity. And a person who questions um, explicit and implicit forms of power, privilege, inequality, and inequity. So those are all ways that you can identify and assess intercultural competencies, all right? Some more ways here that you can kind of look on. Again, I know you know how to read, so uh, I won't go into this too in depth. But just redefining what Katie already expressed regarding ways that you can really take responsibility um, on being able to look at the deeper issues and global issues, apply your communication skills, 
and evaluate solutions. All right, so the important piece of the puzzle for today, right, uh, is really looking at what is it that employers want in regards to intercultural competencies? Employers really want to see candidates with these skills, all right? Um, it's all about communication. If you look at any list across the board from established sites, employers are wanting to have communication. It's always gonna be in your top five, no matter what field um, that you are getting into, all right? Uh, you wanna make sure that it goes beyond communication. So being able to understand a culture difference from your own and being able to have um, that ability to think critically. You're gonna to want to make sure that you're able to understand the nuances, again, of the differences in norms from culture to culture. And then also that big aspect of being able to collaborate with people who are different from yourself. These toolbox of skills, you can call them, um, really think of it as ways that you're able to provide employers who are looking for these different candidates in a competitive job market. So being able to have the credential um, of an undergraduate degree could get your foot in the door, but you being able to clearly articulate what are your key power skills or your soft skills and your transferable skills, that is what's gonna be paramount in moving you from job candidate to being a hired employee. So you're gonna to wanna to make sure to really take some time to meaningfully reflect on any international experiences that you've had or course activities that helped you grow your cultural understanding or any student organizations maybe that you've joined or any events um, that have helped you build your intercultural competencies. And these can all be put into your toolbox of skills. So then ways that employers have defined what intercultural skills means. One descriptor said it's the ability to understand different cultural contexts and viewpoints. And then another descriptor stated demonstrating respect for others, adapting to different cultural settings. And then other descriptors were accepting cultural differences, being able to speak foreign languages and being open to new ideas and ways of thinking. So just to kind of put it in context so that you have an idea of what employers um, are expecting and what they are saying about intercultural skills. So what is the importance you might ask from the employer's viewpoint? All right, well, one employer said employees with these skills can bring in new clients. They can work within diverse teams and support a good brand and a reputation. All right, they also see risks with having employees that do not maybe have these skills. So top risks as identified by employers of those that do not have intercultural, con intercultural competencies, um, loss of clients, damage to an organization's reputation, team conflict, and all of these risks could have an impact on financial implications. All right, so getting into being able to articulate um, Katie went into some of these, but, you know, just really to um, push it in there very clearly for y'all, um, specific tasks that you can look at um, of what you had in your experience. So you can include travel, study abroad, interning abroad, learning new languages, um, any athletic involvement, student organizations, and then any coursework in cultural and international studies. All right. So these are all ways that you can identify specific tasks that you've done in your intercultural competencies. Action verbs that are really good to use to be able to express some of that global and intercultural fluency, uh, collaborate, analyze, communicate that you've discussed, engaged, identified, immerse, interact, learn, listen, participate, recognize, understand, evaluate, and partner. So those are all great action verbs that you could be using in your resume and cover letter and in your interviews to market your global and intercultural fluencies. All right, so the employer's evaluation process in regards to intercultural skills on an application or in the interview process, um, this is not just formally, right? This is where they really look to see how candidates could relate and explain their intercultural skills. So the top five indicators for employers of an applicant who has strong intercultural competencies is that they have strong communication throughout the interview and selection process, that they're able to speak in foreign languages perhaps, 
that the candidate can demonstrate. Did we lose Betsy? Katie, can you still hear me and see me? Yes, wait, I just got you back. All right, perfect. All right, everyone. So just real quickly here, I'm just going to fly through the resume part just because we did offer, you know, two different resume sections um, throughout the summit. And I'm really going to just kind of hit a couple points as it relates to intercultural. All right. So some of the ways, again, that you can demonstrate your experiences that make the most sense to show your cross-cultural experiences. So in the education section, you could list study abroad or an international degree. All right, for experience section, you could list if you had a volunteer or a paid position while being immersed in your study away experience. For a scholarship and academic section, you know, this is where you can really show any research or present any learning projects that you completed during your time of study abroad. And then, of course, listing any international experiences um, that you can highlight. So those are just some examples of what you can include on the resume. All right, I'll go past that one here. Uh, we talked about a little bit of the verbiage of what would be helpful to utilize here on the resume. Uh, again, some of these uh, action verbs and then the actual statement behind it are some examples. So I'll just read one of the, these here. Communicated with current and potential clients in Chinese to address any problems. All right, participated in member meetings to discuss German culture and hone German speaking skills. So just a couple examples of what solid statements would look like to demonstrate and showcase your intercultural accomplishments. All right, so just a reminder, what are the indicators? Here they are. All right, this goes more into the cover letter, but I'm gonna kind of breeze through this um, because we are just running out of time here rapidly. I only have another minute or so. Um, getting to the interview part of career development. So being able to be prepared um, to be able to answer common global or intercultural fluency interview questions, right? So how have you worked towards inclusive practices? Describe a time when you recognized and overcame your cultural biases. Describe a time when you initiated connection with someone from another culture. So these are all different examples of general interview questions that definitely include a component of that global fluency. All right, and we already went over why it matters. Um, so again, just reminders here for you. And then quickly going over a four-year intercultural building plan. So if you're wondering, okay, well, I'm just a freshman or I'm a junior or, oh, no, I'm a senior. What do I do? Again, you know, Katie already shared some great ways to get involved, but here's the list with maybe some more included or some different options of what you can do your freshman year, what you can be participating in your sophomore and junior year to set yourself up for success and give yourself that experience and knowledge. And then of course, senior year, you know, what you should be looking at and being involved at. And of course, utilizing the University Career Center and Intercultural Programs Office, you know, all the way throughout freshman, sophomore, junior, senior. It's never too early to start, never too early. Okay, so um, any, I think I have time for maybe a quick question or two. If any of you have any, go ahead and put it in the chat or you can raise your virtual hand. And then otherwise, if there are no questions, we'll wait around just a little bit, uh, but I wanna make sure to be able to allow you to get to the closing remarks at 1220 that's gonna be put on by our esteemed University Career Center Director. So I'm gonna put the link to get into the closing remarks portion of the summit right here in our chat. But again, students, please feel free to reach out to me or to Katie at any point um, and ask your questions, make your appointment. Uh, we really wanna hear from you. I mean, it's that would probably be my biggest advice, Katie, I don't know about you, is that we have all these amazing, so helpful student services that students either don't know about or they just don't utilize. And it just, it goes to waste when we've got all these experts and people there that can help our students really achieve success. Um, so that's the biggest thing I want you to walk away with is that come visit the University Career Center, come visit intercultural programs and, and learn how you can really set yourself up for success. Katie, did you want to add anything else? No, I was just going to say, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, I'd be happy to answer any I can. 
All right, perfect. Sounds good, everyone. Well, thank you so much. And we'll see you here in just a few seconds at the closing remarks portion of today's summit.